Um, so, yeah, I'll take you through uh, some of the work that we've been doing in California, understanding the, the conscious community over there, or you know, Californian red meat consumer. Um, so, uh, I'll take it as where you might have heard of the uh, Taste Pure Nature, the country of origin uh, brand work that we've been doing, that we've been developing. Uh, but as a cook recap, we've been developing a, a country of origin brand, Taste Pure Nature, to, um, to basically act as a kind of mental shortcut for consumers when they're purchasing our product. So, move it from being a commodity but to, to being something that captures um, some of the best things about New Zealand in a brand. Um, why we're doing this, yeah, so moving away from being a commodity, but also because some of our competitors, most notably um, two Aussie beef and lamb, are doing things like this. Canada beef um, have a brand as well. It's interesting, I was doing some, I was doing some uh, thinking and, and internet searching before this, and I was looking up for US beef brands, and, um, and what pops up there is uh, typically kind of horror stories about US factory farming. So, I mean, it can embody some positive brand messages, but also some, some negative ones. So what we're trying to do with that is, is really tell a really good story about New Zealand um, to the rest of the world. Um, we've chosen California as the, the launch market for this. A um, few reasons for this. Uh, it's the second biggest by value and volume after China now, uh, in terms of our, our red meat. Um, it's also got the largest population in the US, and it's also kind of an incubator for food trends in the US. So they, they tend to say it'll happen first in, in, in California before it, before it happens in the rest of the country. And certain trends like grass-fed certainly came out of, of California. Um, we are gonna be doing China next, um, but I think also with California, it gave us the chance to sort of test the waters with the Taste Pure Nature brand, um, and it's a lot more transparent as a market. You, 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 it's easier to understand where your product is, um, interact with some of the distributors and retailers, where it's a lot more opaque in China. So what we hope to do from this launch in, in California is learn some things, certainly um, see how the brand lands, and, and hopefully um, the initial results are quite positive, uh, roll it out more widely outside of California and around the world. So some numbers, so our budget for, for the Taste Pure Nature campaign for year one, which is primarily focused on, on California, is 3.5 million, which probably sounds like a lot, certainly if you're a levy payer, it sounds like a lot, but there are a lot of people in the US and certainly a lot of people in, in California, so you, if you're boiling it down, you're getting roughly nine cents per consumer to get the message across. And why I'm saying this is, is the consequences of that is you, can't, you don't wanna to talk to everyone, um, you wanna make, make your money work as hard as possible and really target who you want to talk to and get the message right. Um, and for comparison, MLA, Meat and Livestock Australia, with a, have, have around a budget of around 60 million. Not necessarily all for California, but that shows you that our main competition, especially in the export space, have, are putting a lot of money into it as well. So, um, so this piece was really about making our budget, our marketing budget work as hard as possible to get the message out there about Taste View Nature and, and the, the great red meat that New Zealand has. Um, also, a little bit of context about advertising in the US. Um, so the average American, uh, I got this statistic from the American Marketing Association, is exposed to up to 10,000 marketing or brand messages a day. So there's a lot going on. Um, messages telling me what to buy, what not to buy, what to eat, what not to eat, drink, smoke, all those sorts of things. So um, making that sort of, uh, that nine cents per consumer, get that message across when they're being bombarded by a range of extra marketing is quite a challenge. Um, and a single 30 second TV ad uh, costs around $123,000 US to run once on one channel and they've got a lot of channels and a lot of media. Obviously it fluctuates, you'd probably be paying four million for the Super Bowl. Um, and for this campaign we haven't used TV partially because it's very expensive to do and it's difficult to target, but that again gives you the sort of sense that while it feels like a relatively large amount to spend on marketing and getting the brand out there, 3.5 million, um, it's, it's expensive to, to market in the US. Oh, uh, hands up, who likes ads? Who likes watching ads? Me? Marketing, who likes marketing? A few, <laughs> a smattering. Um, 
most people don't like ads. Um, most people are actively trying to not look at what you're trying to sell them. 11% um, of consumers said that they like ads, but on the other hand, 89% of them said they either are ambivalent or actively hate advertising. So again, you're, you're spending money to try and get people to look at something that they don't want to look at, cut through amongst the 10,000 um, brand messages that they might see a day, um, and it's very expensive to do so. So it's, there's certainly some challenges with engaging people in this market. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's critical with that budget to, to get the right message to the right target, and up here are some of the, the conscious foodies, as we've turned them, that we talked to, some actual consumers that we, um, that we wanted to target and get a message across to. Or otherwise, you could um, get it to the wrong target for someone who will serve you know, cold hamburgers um, at their house to their guests in cardboard boxes. So these are not the meat consumers that we want to talk to. We want to talk to conscious foodies who care about where their product comes from and, uh, and, and, and want to eat our high-quality red meat. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, about the process, about how we've faced down some of these challenges and... Um, and developed our message and show you some of the advertising and show, show you some of the consumers that we've spoken to to, to get our message right. Uh, what we did orig originally was a, a large global segmentation across seven markets, including the US, but another six countries as well, <clears throat> which was really to understand who is buying our product who is, and who is relevant to be buying our product, or if they're not buying our product, who would be the right target. Uh, once we understand at a kind of broad level who that was, we did some focus, uh, a focus deep dive into the, the conscious foodie. Then we showed them some ads, um, and I'm gonna show you some of the ads uh, and the early ads that we showed to them as well, some concepts. And then we've uh, launched, we launched in March, and validated and tracked how our advertising has been performing so far. Okay. So narrowing the focus into, into a global segmentation. Um, in terms of who we spoke to, so there's a six segments that we could have uh, could have looked at, but essentially we've narrowed it down to the conscious foodie segment. The, the other other segments were typically ones that didn't want to pay a lot for their meat, didn't really care about where it came from. We're looking for volume over quality, and we're looking for convenience in their meat. So maybe purchasing in fast food or, or, or exclusively fast food outside of the sort of a higher value product that we wanted to sell them. Um, the initial kind of first cup of this conscious foodie that we wanted to talk to, um, they had some particular trays that made them most relevant to our product. So they cared about animal welfare. So with zero being the norm, so 21% 20, 20, cared more about um, animal welfare versus the norm. Um, they were influenced by environmental concerns as well, so the environmental uh, impact of how their food was produced. Um, they also liked to use food as a kind of centerpiece for socializing. Um, they had heightened awareness of their own personal health and wanted food that could either positively support that health or wasn't negatively impacting it. Um, they weren't seeking convenience necessarily, so they were uh, sort of willing to work a little bit harder to, to prepare a meal or, or go, go out of the way to go to a restaurant which served higher quality food. Um, they were uh, experimental, uh, enjoys experimenting with their food, which not in a kind of laboratory setting, but rather, you know, like trying new things, like trying new restaurants, like trying new cuts, that sort of thing. Um, and they were sort of averagely sensitive about price. So no one, unless you're a kind of a Mark Zuckerberg billionaire, is completely insensitive to price, but these people were uh, willing to consider products that were priced at a premium, assuming that they met the other sort of criteria around animal welfare, environmental footprint, those kinds of things. And I'm gonna show you some of them now. So here's a sort of short video bringing some of these people to life. I think that food is like life, like you need food to live but also it, it's what brings you together. When you're eating, you can t share anything. What excites me about food is uh, trying different recipes and 
getting the recipe right, like the texture, if you know, if you're cooking a steak that it has like the crust on it, or if it's, if you're making pasta that it's like al dente, it's kind of a certain way that it should be enjoyed. And if you can cook it right that way, it's amazing. I was reading a few years ago that like, I guess no human being really gets all the nutrients that they need every single day. And so I kind of worry that like, even though I eat a lot, that like there's maybe something I'm missing. I take magnesium, that, that helps with um, just overall like muscle health. I have, what is that, vitamin D, protein shake, acacia fiber, uh, collagen, uh, ashwagandha, super B, triple omega, and calcium magnesium. I love to cook. I almost never eat out. Um, and, and you know, the restaurant food can be, you don't know what they put in it, it could be fatty. Cooking things, everything from scratch, is very, very, very important. Food's important because you have one life, you need to live it, you need to live it well. Um, so I, you know, I think Americans really know their steaks and they, they know their beef. I feel like Americans really are aware of good steak versus not good steak. Like, I've always loved beef, you know? And then as I got older, um, I just fell in love with lamb because like it was just the texture of it and everything about it, I was just like, ooh. Um, I think, yeah, I think with lamb and Americans, it's not, it hasn't been um, so widely embraced. Like, I don't remember going to barbecues and having lamb when I was little. So I kind of didn't grow up with it. It was an acquired taste and it was, um, you know, watching different shows and, and watching different chefs from all over cooking it and eating it that I kind of started getting a taste for it. I mean, I get inspired by shows and blogs. Food 52 is a really great one. Yumly, which is a food recipe website. And show like seven different ways to make lamb. And then you can look it up on the internet. And they are the easiest recipes to follow. I do follow Aisha Curry. Um, I do go to her page a lot uh, just because she you know, has, like she cooks, she's got her show, she's got like cookware. Most Americans are totally fine with an, an over injected, hormone filled product. It's what they know, it's what they're used to and it's what they can afford. So what's important to me is, um, and what I usually look for in meats, is that it's pasture-raised, organic, and uh, grass-fed. It has to be very high quality, uh, uh, grass-fed, organic, um, fresh if possible. Um, that, that's, that's extremely important to me. I educated myself on different meats and the origins of the meats through cooking shows and reading recipes and um, a lot of the, the first actually origin of meat that I heard that was important is lamb from New Zealand. I don't know why, but I just think of like this open land, um, a bit of like maybe not foggy air, but like a sort of like mists in the air. Pastures and big open spaces. And regarding animals, I just kind of feel like there's a light mist and they're all eating on the, the pasture and just kind of hanging out and it's just a gorgeous country. I would buy meat from a different country for the simple fact that I, uh, I would get something different. And so I don't just keep wanting to eat the same thing over and over and over again from LA when I can have something special from New Zealand. What comes to mind when I think of New Zealand is like koala bears and funny talking people. They're eating grass instead of like feed that has antibiotics and all that stuff in it. I feel like I'm doing my body a bit more justice in the sense that um, I'm not gonna suffer later. I would imagine as a richer taste, fuller, more flavorful, more juicy, uh, more tender, all of the all of the things you want, a little more enhanced.
so, I mean, I think this was a really useful exercise to do to really understand what these people, their kind of starting point, especially around um, the kind of things that were important, which has shaped our message. Um, we also used this to sub-segment our original conscious foodie segment into sub-segments around health and eating experience. So as you saw the guy with the mastery of vitamins and minerals who he was feeding to himself, we know that um, messaging around um, the, the product qualities that we have and how that can enhance health as well. But also um, a, a couple of, the, especially some of the, the women in that, you know, meat is a centerpiece. Meat is something, is an experience for people to enjoy and engage and how, you know, the, our product qualities can ladder up into that and, and to enhance that. Um, and that certainly needed to be part of our, our messaging. Um, also, you know, refining where to target them and the kind of influences that they would look to. Again, you can see some of their media preferences and the kind of places that they're looking for cooking advice or eating advice as well. And also to start developing ideas around messaging and communications, the kind of things that, um, that are going to engage these people. And again, um, we did some few further refinement after this, but this was a sort of starting point for, for understanding this. Um, so yeah, so we've... After this, we also narrowed the target. So, you know, we've almost 40 million in California, down to 3 million if we narrow the age range to 28 to 54. Um, what we saw in the research as well, probably not from that video, but um, a lot of younger consumers were eating a much narrower range of cuts. So you're sort of 18, 18 to 28, so they were not eating your bone and ribeyes or your New York strips, so are eating things like filet mignon or only eating in food service and not doing a lot of at-home preparation. And younger people were, um, were typically didn't have the money necessary to, to purchase higher quality or premium meat, so weren't really in the price point for the type of product that we were wanting to sell to them. They were also shopping in typically upmarket organic stores. You may have heard of Whole Foods, um, which is owned by Amazon, but they're a big kind of sort of have a stake in the ground around higher quality, better welfare, grass-fed meat, um, and also Bristol Farms, um, Trader Joe's. There's some uh, higher-end retailers in the U.S., again, narrowing our target to uh, people who are shopping for their meat in those sort of locations. Um, we also narrowed our target to focus on people who were making more of their decisions in shops or retail rather than in food service, as in restaurants, mainly because... Um, it was a lot more engagement if you were making your decision in a, in a retail store or a shopping, shopping center because you could see all of the product qualities and all the signage there. Um, in in uh, restaurants or food service, people would typically might think about origin or think about some of the raising claims of some of the meat they were eating, but it was far lower engagement versus um, a supermarket. So after we uh, narrowed down our target, we uh, used this to do some creative testing and develop some ads. Um, this is not what the uh, viewing facility looked like. This is stolen from Mad Men. Um, it's quite a dingy, dark um, viewing facility. It was typically quite hot. Um, so it's not nearly this gla glamorous. Um, and we went in with some, some early stage ideas. So uh, we have a creative team based in Seattle in the US um, who uh, went, went along on this journey with us and, and viewed some of the footage that you've just seen, but also was part of these uh, discussion groups where we came up with some ideas, showed them, showed them to consumers, and got their feedback on it um, to tweak some of our thinking. Um, we learned a lot. I mean, I'm going to share with you a few sort of things, sort of top line um, ideas about how we wanted to position our target. This is to, to uh, position our message for maximum effect. Things like what sort of meat did this target group um, like or react well to? Some that might be too fatty or too lean. There was a sweet spot in the middle which with a degree of marbling. Um, also, the kind of cuts that they were looking for. Some people were turned off or overwhelmed by something that was too large or too small, thought of as a bit finicky or, or not that appealing, getting that kind of sweet spot in the middle there as well. Um, also, how to show New Zealand. So, as an origin brand, New Zealand or the country is critical to this. So again, showing them imagery around New Zealand and what they reacted well to. Uh, New Zealand goes down pretty well because we've got such a beautiful country. Um, Snow-capped mountains just felt a little bit too far away from the kind of pastoral settings that, uh, that they wanted to see. Um, also, they didn't want to see um, close-ups of the animals. You, have, you can have animals in the distance, but you don't want to kind of close-up on the cow you're about to consume. Um, so 
so that guided our thinking about how to handle New Zealand. Also, you don't want to over-egg New Zealand. While, while it's quite tempting because we've got a, such great imagery as to go New Zealand, New Zealand, New Zealand, you can start making a very expensive beef and lamb ad for New Zealand tourism rather than beef. So it needs to be there, but it needs to be treated with a bit of balance. Um, also, one of, the, um, one of the jobs that we found that we had to do was uh, build New Zealand's reputation in red meat. Um, and by way of doing this, we needed some kind of endorsement, which could have been a chef or a butcher or someone who would um, fill a bit of a blank space that they had for the quality of New Zealand meat. They had no reason to doubt it wasn't very good, um, but we felt like from our initial findings that we wanted someone to, to be able to talk about the virtues of um, New Zealand red meat, so a chef or a butcher. Um, we found, and it sort of broke my heart a bit, but the, the bald guy with the beard um, is an actual guy working in a supermarket in California selling New Zealand red meat, but, um, but uh, US consumers didn't like him, even though he was actually genuinely selling the product and quite knowledgeable. He's, um, he works on behalf of one of the, the processors and, and really pushes New Zealand product, but they found he was a little bit retro um, and not aspirational enough. They wanted someone who looked like he was working in I don't know, a, a repurposed Manhattan warehouse and with dark lighting and trendy. That it, but uh, so we, that's kind of guided our creative vision for some of the advertising that we, um, that we did as well and, and that endorsement of a, of a quality product. Um, oh, so, I'm gonna, <laughs> so we didn't, there was, it was a, certainly a journey um, and I debated whether to show you some of the early stage uh, uh, ads from this. Um, so we were working, as I said, with this creative agency in Seattle, and they like Hugh, and I was and, and I was working with Mike Wan on this. And they, they, their first draft, they came, Hugh, we've got Hugh and Mike, we've got this great idea. This is this is I think this is really going to work for us. How about we show you know show the limited inputs by showing that New Zealand farmers have their feet up and they're sitting around in hammocks, they're not like, out there feeding them grain or pumping them full of antibiotics. I'm like. Yeah, I, I don't think <laughs> this isn't going to quite cut it uh, at this time to show our, show our farmers uh, in hammocks with their feet up. I think we might need to go to the drawing board. So, so there was a, was a journey to get there and, uh, and find the right message um, to, to get across. Um, so I'm going to show you the final video ad. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, the beef and the lamb advertising on, on the left. So this has gone online and... Um, I think billboards and print, and it's, it looks pretty simple and uh, probably quite obvious to how we got there, but I'm going to talk a little bit about what's behind this. So actually, what we found, getting the message extremely simple was critical. You, again, you've got their attention for a split second, they've got 10,000 other messages firing at them one day, you, you've got to keep your message extremely simple. So we did three things. We said meat, showed them the meat, showed them the product. New Zealand, we show it twice in the logo and in the, in the copy, and show them a picture of grass to make sure it's grass-fed, and mention grass-fed in the copy as well. So getting those three elements, bang, right across to them is, is critical, and so they understand what you're, what you're trying to sell them. Again, if you dial up New Zealand too much, it goes into tourism. If you don't picture the meat or picture a farm or an animal, they don't know what you're talking about, so being super explicit, um, with some of the messaging has, has been really key to getting that message across. It's all, it's all New Zealand meat as well, I'm reassuring you. So while the ad and the advertising was shot in, uh, in Seattle, they made sure to import some New Zealand meat to, to be part of this as well. I'll show you the video ad as well. The secret to cooking a great lamb chop begins with great tasting lamb, a cut with a nice thick medallion, tantalizingly tender and lean. In other words, grass-fed lamb from New Zealand, where open pastures and lush green grasses let the flocks graze 365 days a year. Lamb that's naturally delicious needs nothing more than a hot fire and a good fork. Taste lamb like nature intended. Taste pure nature. Okay, so again, keeping it quite simple, quite direct, um, the use of New Zealand, certainly we, wanted, we want as an origin brand to make sure it's there, but also having the meat is almost the hero within the ad, just to make sure that everyone's super clear about what we're talking about and the, and the product. Right, so this is a lot of, probably looks like gobbledygook on the slide, but um, I'm going to highlight some of the points. So now I'm going to talk about how we've done and, and how we're tracking. Um, so this is, uh, so 
those ads that I've just shown you go as banners online, and you can kind of track that. Um, and down the left-hand side, you've got all these different types of, uh, of groups that Google let you um, choose to show your ad to. Um, so you've got people who are shopping in natural grocery stores like Whole Foods, people who are chefs. You've also got people who are using some of the keywords that we define, searching for beef and lamb. So you have all of that sort of, um, all, all of those audiences that you make sure that when they're online, they get served up your banners, um, talking about New Zealand beef and lamb. They've also got something I've circled called lookalikes. So also Google will say to you, hey, um, with our tracking and all the cookies that go on your phone and all the kind of information that we're gathering about you, we, we can uh, use our model to give you an audience, even though it doesn't look like it necessarily fits, that you can serve up your ads to and see how they perform. And then, then you get all these metrics around the cost of the ads, how many impressions, basically how much it gets served up. Um, but the key one down the bottom is, is your click-through rate, which is basically you show someone an ad, how many times it gets shown to people, how many times people are clicking on it. So um, a good click-through rate is 0.15 to 0.22, and we are at 0.18. So 0.18% of people who are shown the ad click on it for more information to go through the website. So we're, we're, we're doing... Uh, sort of the middle of what's considered good uh, in terms of a click-through through rate in terms of our ad performance. Um, the video is performing really well. So I'm sure you guys have all experienced, I don't know if you've gone on YouTube or any other sites where you've, where you've been wanting to watch something. I, I tend to do it a lot on DIY these days, but um, you want to see an ad and they'll play you an ad, an annoying ad you don't want to watch and you'll, you'll cancel it. Um, but roughly 50% of the people who are shown our ad um, actually watch it the whole way through, which is double the industry average. And um, again, with any of this sort of stuff, um, the media agencies will tell me if a number's interesting, it's usually wrong. So they did double check this before they gave it to me. Um, but actually, the ad's performing extremely well. Uh, we've been trying to come, get to the bottom of why this might be, but I think it might be the fact that we've used a New Zealand accent in it. Um, it's probably a little bit different. So it's, it's to California consumers. So the funny talking people, um, it's, it's capturing their interest, so they're watching it all the way through. And, um, and it's probably a little bit different to the types of advertising they're used to seeing. This also means that the cost to, of us to serve this ad to people who are relevant to is very low. Again, it's point, point, uh, 0 0.03 cents for someone to watch it, um, which is roughly half the industry average. So again, the video that we've put together, keeping it really simple, uh, making sure that the elements are there, um, and having something that's a little bit different probably for the California consumer using a, a New Zealand accent is, a, is meaning that our video is really working well to get our message across. We're also doing some tracking along time, alongside this. So um, we're, we're running some, some questionnaires with people um, who qualify as being conscious foodies in San Francisco and LA. So we're doing that alongside the campaign. Um, when you ask them, you ask them spontaneously, have you seen any, any advertising around beef and lamb? Um, there's only a really small handful of people who say, yes, I've seen the Taste Pure Nature campaign out of this audience. But if you prompt them and you show them some of the imagery, um, more than a quarter of this audience that we've surveyed thus far recall seeing the campaign, which is, again, I did check this with my, um, my tracking agency. I said, are you sure this number's right because it's very high? But it actually, um, we're getting really good cut through amongst this audience that we're, we're talking to. And I, they, they've said this is partially testament to the fact that we've really narrowed down the target of who we want to talk to and, um, and engage with, which is, which is really reassuring. And they're getting the, the message around the origin brands. And 90% of people are getting the fact that it's a New Zealand campaign. So, so it's all going pretty well. And there's just, they also collect some verbatim feedback from people. So you know, they know that they're getting a, making a great choice when it comes to purchasing New Zealand red meat and enjoying uh, the, natu a natu the most natural taste possible, just as nature intended. So um, it's, it's a really positive story from from the initial campaign run in California. So what we're going to be doing next, so align this with some sales data, so hopefully as, as positive in terms of the media tracking as some, some sales or people making sales inquiry, further track the campaign, and then China is next for our um, localization of the campaign and launch. Cool. So, so I assume there's questions. Questions? Any questions? No questions? <laughs> yep, do you want to? How much, how much of your campaign is going to be on social media? Because that's the only key player. 
yeah, so it's, 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 it's all uh, essentially online and digital. Um, I've used the TV ad example because it's quite difficult to get, a, because digital campaigns are usually designed and quite specific to what you're working on. It's quite hard to compare across, whereas TV ad space is quite um, consistent. But yeah, it's all going to be on, on digital or using, or, or using influencers in the social media space. So essentially getting people on Instagram or Twitter who have a large following and are interested in the category to, to talk about it online. Any concerns, RE Food Miles? Uh, yes, and that's part of the reason why we narrowed the target upwards. I think um, younger conscious foodies, especially in the US and especially in San Fran, are getting more concerned around localism with it and, and, uh, and buying local. It's partially about food miles, but it's partially also about um, supporting local industry as well, or local ranches as they term them. So. Um, it's probably going to, unfortunately, be as it's as it's that younger kind of millennial or younger than millennial generation. It's probably something that's going to increase on people's minds. But it really means that we need to get our our story across as to why you'd want to purchase an imported product and and, and why it's better. Uh, what are the feedback from for processes involved? Generally, very positive. Um, we have uh, three partners that we're working with in market uh, in California. Um, First Light. Atkins Ranch and the Lamb Company, um, they're all on board with this um, and are going to be starting to link their product to the Taste Pure Nature website, which is where people will click through so they can work out where to purchase it. And we're doing some partner programs with them as well, um, with influencers um, to, to have influencers using or consuming their product and, um, and linking it with their brands. Uh, so... Yes, so to be part of the Taste Pure Nature program, um, and my, my boss, Nick Beebe, might be a, more of an expert on this than I am, but I, but I believe it. everyone needs to be uh, part of an NZFAP program to supply into Taste Pure Nature. Um, but yeah, th those, sorts of, uh, those sorts of qualities and characteristics of the product need to be there. Also, um, I think from this campaign and when people have been exposed to it and seen it, you know, they're really positive, but it does put New Zealand on a bit of a pedestal. So I think if there's any expose or people um, tried and gotcha and, and prove otherwise that the campaign's not as is not pure nature as, as we're claiming, that, that will be a challenge. So making sure that we get everyone aligned to deliver that is really key. Uh, yes, um, it's got an ambitious claim. It's not taste pure nature on its own. But um, the whole suite of activities is to move from eight billion to eleven billion um, in terms of value for the for the um, for the market, um, and and not relying on volume to do that. So it does have sales targets um, at a kind of macro level to, to lift the industry. Um, yeah, so we haven't called it out. We don't call out it being organic meat. Um, I think there is, they are projecting some things in there. So they're looking at some of the imagery and um, uh, how we talk about our meat and, and making assumptions about, oh, this is, this is close to organic. Um, organic's not for everyone. I think they, they will navigate around it. Certainly grass-fed is a starting point for a lot of um, US consumers. Then they'll look for, some of them are looking for antibiotic-free and some of them are looking for growth-promoting hormones-free as well. But um, it, even within this conscious foodie um, segment, there's actually not not all of them are searching out organic, and some of them are, are willing to consider non-organic. Um, but yeah, we're not explicitly saying that New Zealand red meat under the Taste Pure Nature banner is organic. Uh, traceability. Yes, I mean, I, I think part of, especially the sub-segment around food experience, part of the experience is, is having a bit of a story behind what the product is and, and enjoying that. So I think it's not something that they're hanging out for or, or necessarily raising, but I think um, building traceability and, and, and back to farm for some of the product is quite appealing um, for this audience. This is something that we're working with partners um, with on at the moment. 
I haven't shared this with you today, but we do have some research that we've done as well, looking at co-branding with the Taste Pure Nature brand on pack. Obviously, some of the processes and the partners, quite rightly, who are already in California, have invested in their brands and invested in, um, in, in raising this, their standards and, and, and marketing. So um, there are conversations around putting the Taste Pure Nature branding on their packs um, to leverage both. Um, the research that we did did show an uplift, and I think um, aligned with the campaign and the fact that it's having such cut through with this audience, we think it would be a no-brainer to put uh, Taste Pure Nature branding on some of the partners' packs, but uh, we just that's a work in progress. Yes, we do have a dedicated Facebook marketing page. I don't know, I can't rattle off the URL now, but, it, but it's there. You can probably search for it on your phone now. Well, we, we, uh, I think we want to align all of uh, New Zealand red meat. Well, that would be, that would be our ideal under the Taste Pure Nature brand. We think it really um, encompasses some of the best things about New Zealand producing, New Zealand products in, in one place, and it feels like a really good fit. People don't argue with it or find it odd. Um, so I think, you know, if after China, I'm, I'm, I'm not party to the exact strategic plan, but I think we'd hope to roll it out into all of our key export markets. Threats to the brand. Uh, well, uh, how are you educating consumers out of farming practices in other countries? Um, so when they're clicking through to some of the web, web pages, they can find out a little bit about that. Um, and also, uh, once we have partners on board, which, which is happening, and well, fully on board, they can go to the partners um, who, who are, who are under the Taste Pure Nature brand and, and find out more. We have a little bit about the kind of farming practices, um, grass-fed, and um, the antibiotic use uh, or, or lack of and lack of hormone use on the Taste Pure Nature website so they can dig around and find out a little bit more about that if they want to. How am I for time? Have I got uh, one, more. one more? A couple more questions? Um, yeah, so it's mainly web-based. Um, the advertising is, is, again, by necessity for people's attention, quite focused on getting those two or three things across to people. How much money is left? Uh, we haven't spent it all yet. Um, it's, gonna, it's a 12-month campaign, so it'll run across the year. Um, so we've done our first flighting of advertising, so we've got another four or so flights left for the year. So, yeah. Not, not all gone yet. One more. One more. Uh, how are you ensuring the quality of the product is high uh, and once they purchase? Well, you know, I mean, ideally we'd have all New Zealand red meat under the same banner. Um, at this launch we have um, been working with three partners um, who, who've, who've applied through the license program and that we're comfortable with who, who, will, who align in terms of their product, their processing and availability with the brand. Um, yeah, I mean, I think... Yeah, there's always that danger that you, if you go too big and too broad and, and you get people that aren't meeting your values that you can undermine the whole, um, whole brand itself and the brand equity. But yeah, at this stage, we're keeping it small to make sure that we're um, doing as best job possible. All right.